Hi, I'm Eric Beinhacker. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Martin School at the University of Oxford. And today we're going to be talking about the future of macroeconomics, how new approaches to macro uh, may help give us new insights into some of the big challenges uh, that the world faces and also help us uh, develop better solutions and policies for those challenges. And to talk about the future of macro, we're uh, very fortunate to have uh, David Vines with us today. Uh, David is a professor of economics at Oxford, a fellow of Balliol College, and uh, one of the leaders at, in our research center, INET at Oxford, um, on the uh, Future of Macro project. And uh, as part of that, he has been a, a co-leader uh, of an initiative uh, with the uh, Oxford uh, Review of Economic Policy uh, called the Rebuilding Macro Theory Project. Um, hi, David. Thank you for, for joining us. Good to be here. Uh, and um, just to start us off, David, just to give us a bit more of, of, of your background, could you uh, just uh, say for a minute or two, what drew you into macroeconomics? Why macro? Well, it, it goes back a long way. Uh, I have the vivid memory when I was at school of being taught macro by a very good teacher. But I put my hand up and said, look, I can't understand this Keynesian economic stuff. Uh, it, it looks to me like if I'm a good person running a bank and someone increases their savings, then it's my job as a bank manager to lend out to somebody. And I just can't understand why savings uh, doesn't always equal investment and what this Keynesian effective demand problem actually is. And it was in my second year as an undergraduate, I still remember walking home after a lecture in which the final piece of the ISLM system was put in place. And I could see that the LM curve just stopped this happening. And I said, you know, this is a really big picture idea. And, and I want to do macro because I get this sense that some insight like that will really under help me understand the way the world works. Well, and there are big questions uh, to think about in, in macro. Um, you know, as we saw uh, in the wake of the 2008 crisis, uh, macroeconomic theory went through a crisis itself because um, uh, uh, many of the theories and models and ideas for modern macro did not perform very well uh, during the 2008 crisis. And that led to a, a real period of soul searching in the field about what went wrong and, and uh, what we might be able to do to. Uh, fix it and and how we could make macro more useful in the real world, uh, particularly to policymakers. So, David, uh, as part of that, you've uh, teamed up with a group of very um, uh, prestigious macroeconomists and the Oxford Review of Economic Policy, uh, and initiated this this rebuilding macro theory project. Just tell us a bit about that project and who's involved and and what it's about. As when the GFC hit. And we we're all watching, you know, that um, all of us remember, a bit like when Kennedy died, uh, we all remember the day layman's went down, what we were doing that day. Mm. And, and I asked myself, does what I teach in first year graduate macro class have absolutely anything to say about this? And I was busy teaching the new Keynesian DSG model. And the answer is just straight, no. And, and so I said, well, that's where I began. And, and I'd been fortunate enough to be talking with Olivia Blanchard. I'd been a visitor at MIT a few years earlier about macro stuff and same with Paul Krugman and, uh, and, and, and same with Joe Stiglitz. The three of them came on board. Interesting, different perspectives. Olivia, a constructor of the central view, he, his, his wonderful blog posts at Peterson Institute on the future of macro, which ended up as part of our Oxrep issue, um, were part of our story. Uh, everyone will know Paul Krugman has a very simple, keep it simple story about what went wrong, and uh, which is a wonderfully MIT story that comes from Bob Solo. Absolutely be clear. And, and Joe Stiglitz is the wonderful opposite of that. Let's make it really complicated in order to give you ins But the wonderful thing about Joe is that you get a sense also that there's a, 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 a really clear 
simplicity at the back of all this. Uh, those three, uh, some local stars, uh, and, and call them stars, I think it's real, uh, Simon Ren Lewis, uh, John Milbauer, a few others. Um, and our first issue three years ago was basically what's wrong with the, you know, what's wrong with the lectures that I give on, on New Keynesian DSG model. And, and as I, and I did this with, with my colleague, Sam Wills. Uh, and as we put this together, we realized that what we were really doing was looking for the perfect platonic form the perfect New Keynesian GSG. And, and one of my colleagues, Chris Adam, who's the editor of the, of, of, uh, the managing editor of Oxrib, said to me, you know, that ambition that you think you've learned from doing this, it's not true. Korgman and Stiglitz and Mühlbauer and others, they're not on board with this perfect platonic form. They want something else. <laughs> Go away, David, and, and think about what the something else is. Hmm. And, 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 and that's why we did the second issue. And, and I'll talk about that in, in due course. But not just, so we're not just rock throwers. We're not the plenty of people who will give you a well-formed speech about what's wrong with the new Keynesian DSG model. Hmm. We've, yeah. We've got. We're going further than that. Now, now, before we we get into the you know how to fix it um, uh, part, which is where we'll spend most of our time, uh, it is worth um, just uh, trying to summarize or consolidate the, the the what's wrong view. Now, you have you know this um, set of stars from the field of economics. You know Blanchard, Krugman, Stiglitz, and 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 so on, um, and. Uh, you hear lots of different criticisms thrown out about the standard model, the so-called New Keynesian dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. Uh, economists yep. will create it, create it branding and labeling, a very snazzy, uh, <laughs> snazzy title. We do it by initials. We've got it down to NKDSG. DSG, <laughs> um, yeah, which has been yeah. the standard standard model for uh, for quite some time and heavily, you know, relied on by. Um, central banks, policymakers, IMF, uh, places like that. Did you get consensus about what's wrong? We, you know, you hear criticisms that, well, the models weren't much use in a financial crisis because they didn't have a financial sector in them. The models didn't have, you know, banks and so on in them. Um, you know, questions about, you know, very strong assumptions about agent rationality that, you know, we're all perfectly looking into the future. Um, you know, uh, long-standing critiques that people like Stiglitz have had about uh, availability of information. What did you find a common ground on the on the what's wrong part? Uh, it's a good question, and I think the answer is, it, to be honest, no. I could pretend that the answer was yes by saying, "Well, there's lots of stuff wrong with it, isn't there?" Hmm. And and we all said that, but. But um, if you look at Olivier Blanchard's blog posts, um, his view is that, of course, and, and he's, he has a wonderful piece in the NBER, uh, I, I can't remember exactly the, 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 um, the annual issue, but, but it's um, it, at the same time, beginning of 2018 or end, end of 2017, about what which frictions to put in the model to make it, cre shall I say, credible, good enough, what we need. And remember my project, and Olivia was on board with this idea, my project was to be able to give a set of lectures to the first year graduate students that equipped them well for thinking about macro. And, and I think that Olivia still believes, and some people still believe, that the new Keynesian DSG model, when properly fixed, this perfect platonic form will, will, will somehow emerge. Um, well, you know, very quickly, we're into glass half empty, glass half full stuff, uh, or how long is a piece of string stuff. Um, and so I think that we ended up with consensus that there is a long piece of string and we're all somewhere along this piece of string. And, but we're, 
if you like, only in one dimension, so we can talk to each other. We're not flying off in all dimensions. Uh, yeah, and I think I think that's where we ended up um, <clears throat> after our first issue. You'll see that I've got one big idea for the, or, or no, I want to say two big ideas for the second issue of, of, of Oxrep, which came out just three months ago. We'll talk about that in a minute. But that's my way of answering your, yeah. your question. So, so it, um, you know, one way maybe to characterize it is, um, you know, we have a, a lot of rocks thrown at the traditional model, you know, um, from, from uh, different directions and with, with different intensity. Some, some people think the, yeah. the, the standard model is more broken and others uh, less so. And, and perhaps we could say that there are broadly two camps. Um, one that thinks that the standard model is uh, salvageable, um, that if we add more frictions, um, add a representation of a financial sector, um, uh, and and you know perhaps a bit of you know more behavioral realism in in um, you know uh, how the representative agent makes decisions and so on, that you know we could we could then get this platonic ideal into a, a more fit for purpose state. Um, that might be one yeah. view. Yeah. Uh, an, another view is um, that the problem is is actually with the standard model uh, and some fundamental aspects of its construction. So we need to be more radical in our in our thinking, um, and, and um, uh, you know either a much more major overhaul or even you know replacing it with something uh, you know with a different approach that that uh, that might work better. Um, a is that sort of a fair characterization of, of the split in the field, and then and then where do you fall in that split? Um, how far do you need to go <laughs> along this piece of string? And the answer is quite a long way. Let's just you know, th I'll say three things. First of all, the Euler equation is a stupid theory of consumption. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there are some aspects of Ricardian equivalence that are sometimes important. So to just junk it and go back to a Keynesian consumption function was entirely behavioral agent-based stuff, just not good enough. So that there was, secondly, uh, I really think that the investment function in the full New Keynesian DSG model in which to investment depends on Tobin's Q and Tobin's Q depends on the difference between the marginal product of capital and the real interest rate set by the central bank, and the marginal product of capital depends on productivity and the productive structure of the economy. It's really important. I have a lot of argument with people who think you can do macro just with an IS curve. You have to go back of the IS curve into not just consumption, but also where what drives investment. And then, and then very quickly, you're talking RBC stuff. And, and technology matters and technical progress matters and Bob Gordon's insights matter. And there's got to be there. So, uh, but of course we know that the perfect capital markets version of the Tobin's Q investment function is silly because firms are liquidity constrained and they're backward looking. See what I'm doing? A, a, a simple framework and you move outwards from with it. And then thirdly, there's nothing more stupid in the universe than the Calvo Phillips curve as a, a way of understanding, you know, <laughs> whoever imagined there was something called the Calvo fairy. Uh, uh, but I had a very, very interesting discussion in doing the first issue of, 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 uh, 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 of the future of macro with Randy Wright, who was one of our, uh, our um, I hope I've remembered his name properly, Randall Wright, um, uh, 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 who is, uh, which, which dimensionality are we, are we on? But I would think of him as the far right of most dimensions. And, and I ended up saying, uh, because he was saying that even something like the Calvo Ferry Phillips curve isn't properly microfounded. That's a silly story. And, and I said to him, but it just does seem important to include in a macro model the fact that I can't go in every morning and meet my college bursar 
and renegotiate my day's pay. Uh, it's just not sensible to start. So, you know, so you start there. And then, of course, people look backwards. And, of course, they have relative wages. And you begin to have labor market structure and all of that stuff. But you can see that on the three key equations of the model, I would take the framework back to the management practices story as a framework that 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 holds the thing together. So with you know with within that framework, you know, you're 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 arguing uh we can do a pretty big renovation uh you know of the consumption function, investment, and so on. Now there's there's a challenge that Paul Romer uh, put forward, which to, to me looks you know, uh, <laughs> more fundamental uh, in, 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 in a paper, uh, a paper yeah. that uh, that got a lot of uh, notice on what's what's wrong with macroeconomics. Um, Romer likened the um, dependence of of the DSG model on exogenous shocks. You know, these exo these mysterious exogenous technology shocks that cause basically all. Uh, change in the model. He likened them to phlogiston, yeah. you know, a, a yeah. mysterious uh, particle that, uh, you know, before modern physics, physicists, physicists would blame any sort of change on a mysterious particle called phlogiston. And so he asked, how do we get rid of this dependence on these mysterious external, you know, shocks to explain anything, this phlogiston uh, out of the models and make change like financial shocks, uh, like business cycles, uh, you know, like, uh, um, you know, shifts in, in institutions and so on. How do we make those things, you know, more endogenous? Uh, I, 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 I chuckled when you talked about the Roma paper because it's such good fun hmm. uh, and, and so important. But you know what? I'm going to come back at you and say something even more radical. Hmm. Uh, it, it, um, that I was... I, I was um, taken with the Roma issue long before the Roma came, paper came out, when I um, uh, uh, it, it collided with the European, uh, I hope I've got the title right, um, Normal Rigidities Network, I, I haven't got the name right, the huge discussion about whether persistence in the Phillips curve was to do with persistence of the shocks versus persistence of the essentially backward looking model. And of course, I was on the backward looking side, learning and all that stuff. But there was a huge army of people out there trying to just put all the persistence in the shocks. And, and, and Rome is just right, this is stupid. But I'm going to say something even more radical. Supposing that you resolve that Roma issue on each equation, and then you ask, how does the system fit together as a system? Now, to go back to my, my, my concerns about my teaching with first-year graduate students, the, it fits together as a system which has a unique equilibrium uh, in a really important way. And this goes way back. It goes back to Samuelson's uh, correspondence principle. James Mead articulated it. And guess what? Alfred Marshall articulated it, and he'd never met even though he had increasing returns, he'd never made, let his supply curve be more downward sloping than the demand curve. So he always had a unique equilibrium. So I was talking with a, a first year MPhil student in Oxford yesterday, and, and I just said to her, has anyone in your lectures all this year used the word tipping point? <laughs> and she said, that's a really interesting word, tipping point. I think it's really important. But, you know, the only person I've ever heard talk about it was in a political economy seminar. And it's just not in the macro course. Mm -hmm. so, so my radical push, and it's how we've, this is the push in the second Oxrap issue, is to go multiple equilibrium. Essentially, the project of our big, long introductory essay in the second uh, issue of Oxrep is to point out that if you take, for example, Alfred Marshall's supply and demand diagrams, if you make the, one of them into an S curve, these things will intersect three times rather than one time. And if you take Paul Krugman's wonderful little 
insight published not long before the GFC into uh, financial crises. Um, he basically has an S type shape of the aggregate demand curve. So that the economy can be in a good equilibrium like it was in the run up to the GFC. Uh, <laughs> I could use the word good equilibrium. The, the, the high growth, God knows how marvelous or not marvelous it was equilibrium up there. But then things begin to happen that pull the aggregate demand curve back. Remember, it's an S-shaped curve. And so you end up with the high, the, the high equilibrium no longer being available and the economy collapses unstably back towards a low level equilibrium. Crucial point, when it gets there, it can't get out of it because that new low level equilibrium is locally stable. Now, Joe Stiglitz's paper in our Oxrep issue is fundamentally about this, this idea and is really interesting. Um, and, 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 and other people, and Tony Venables has another interesting idea about multiple equilibrium, important paper in our issue, uh, in which um, it's worth spelling that out in three sentences because it's so profound. Thinking about Britain's problem of everything that matters happening in London, it's where all, all my sons live, and it being very hard to get things to happen in the north of England. And <clears throat> he, he simply has a, a, a agglomeration externality at work. So that suppose Brexit comes along and, and it's a tragedy and you lose all the car industry in northwest of Durham in north of England, and all that collapses. And then you ask, what's the long run equilibrium for that part of England? And the answer is Amazon warehouses. And the reason you can't get uh, back to where you were before is that once there are no longer the car factories, there are no longer the su supply parts uh, firms, and there are no longer the engineers who know how to do stuff. And if you were doing car manufacturing, and that area collapsed as a place to do it, you wouldn't go back there. Uh, now, I, I go back to my first year undergraduate macro course, uh, graduate macro course. Are, are people being taught that this is really important for technological progress? Are they being taught that Bob Gordon's insights uh, revolve around these kind of nonlinearities? No. No, so I, and you can see, I didn't answer your question about Bob Gordon. Uh, I said there's something else, because I think that this structural point of it, and, and I go back, right back to the beginning of our discussion. I said, uh, when I started, when I was at school, I loved to, uh, I want to do macro because it helps me understand how all the stuff fits together. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is a fitting together story and that's why I think it's even more important than the, the, than, than the Roma story, because when you look at that, that was a single equation complaint. It wasn't a fitting together complaint. It's really important, but I think there are two things up there that really matter. So um, <clears throat> my last question, David, is, is on uh, policy. Um, you know, macroeconomics, um, is is expected to be able to contribute uh, to to policy. You know how do we how do we make the economy uh, run better and give us insights into that? Now, moving from the world of single equilibrium to multiple equilibrium it has some pretty radical impl implications for how we think about policy. In 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 the in the uh, DSG you know world of a single optimal equilibrium, the, the economy is you know magically always gliding back you know yeah. to full employment yeah. equilibrium yeah. at some point. Yeah, you know the role of the policymaker is is pretty straightforward. You basically, you know, you need to have institutions that can absorb the technology shocks and that's right. Shocks that's right. You have to have yeah. institutions to deal with the yeah. project on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sec second, you know, you want to reduce the frictions in the system that you know take it away uh, from its optimal equilibrium, and also, you know, we recognize there are market failures that you know uh, the uh, uh, you know public uh, sector institutions um, need to need to deal with, but in a world of multiple equilibrium, <clears throat> um, you can get stuck in a bad equilibrium. 
um, uh, not all the equilibrium mm. are good or, are optimal. And so then the role of the policymaker seems, uh, you know, more activist that we have to actually, you know, shift, you know, yeah. either, yeah. either yeah. prevent yeah. us from, to use the point you used before, tipping point, prevent yeah. us from tipping into a bad equilibrium or help us get out of one and get into a better one. Untip out of a bad equilibrium, um, yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and let me draw attention to the very important paper in our first OXREP issue by Wendy Carlin and David Soskis. And, and their simple idea is to take the Gordon work and many people's work that's been done on, uh, on um, whether there's been a slowdown on tech, in technical progress or not, and argue that technical progress is very considerably a, 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 a occurs as a, a result of implementation of new ideas. And implementation requires investment and investment only happens when the economy is thriving. And so they produced in that paper a simple but compelling sketch, one of these lovely two-dimensional MIT diagrams with a couple of curves on it, in which uh, there's a good equilibrium when the economy is going along its Ramsey growth path and the uh, New Keynesian DSG model. Uh, remember that in that, the rate of growth of the economy is population growth plus technical progress. And when I'm talking about the endogeneity of that technical progress, well, there's a good equilibrium, terrific, what we teach in the class. But they say, when you have a collapse like the GFC, uh, you go, firms, profits collapse, investment opportunities look fragile, the economy's not growing, who knows how fast, <laughs> look how far I am from irrational expectations mode of thinking in, in those sentences that I stopped halfway through. Who knows how fast the economy is going to go, grow. We won't in, in, in invest, we won't implement new technology. The rate of, dose of technolo technology is therefore, if not zero, then low. And so there's a new Ramsey equilibrium growth path, which is very slow. And guess what that story is doing? It's explaining all those surreal projections that happened in, in 2008, nine, when down, down went the economy and then from the IMF and everywhere else, it all goes back again, more or less to the old growth path. And every year the projections got revised down and down until ultimately people gave up and said, there's a new lower growth path with a lower level of activity than before. Can you see, Policy is right there in the middle of that. Um, can you see to, we, we haven't got uh, two hours to talk about British economic policy now, but I'll say one sentence. Can you see how surreal it is that this government has just abandoned industrial policy immediately after a big collapse larger than that of the GFC in 2008? Uh, so look, uh, all of a sudden there's an alliance between macroeconomists and people who know how to do micro and industrial policy and industrial organization. Um, so that's my answer to that question. It makes a very big difference to policy to think in this multiple equilibrium way. Yeah, well, it's a very interesting shift because, you know, the, the previous um, kind of DSG inspired, you know, freshwater economics, view was much more hands off. Um, mm. you know, uh, mm. Someone, mm. I can't remember who famously put it, you know, you, you know, government's job is to kind of, you know, set the table with mm. you know, sensible regulation, you know, reliable laws and property rights and, and, and low frictions. And then, you know, the businesses will come dine. Um, uh, and, and activist industrial policy was a bad thing because it's subject to capital yeah. and, yeah. and so yeah. on. Uh, this shift is, you know, now saying that uh, to help us get out of bad equilibriums and into good ones that, um, you know, we need to rethink industrial policy. And then also in the context of climate change, yeah. um, shifting to a zero carbon economy, uh, industrial policy needs to play a big role in that. Here's my answer to that conundrum. It's provided by the really exciting early work that I did as a young researcher 
working with James Mead, but in particular with the control engineer doing feedback rules for macro policy. And what I learned from this control engineer, who I still work with, a man called Jan Majewski in Cambridge, is that control engineers know about this kind of nonlinearity issue. And they say the task of good policy is to keep you out of the region in which the bad equilibrium is the attractor. And we know what attractor means. It means the local equilibrium in that part of the space. But that, that says, be careful. And it's articulating a precautionary principle of a kind of macro. And that changes a lot the way you think compared to what you just said, Eric. Yeah. Well, and I, I can't resist, uh, as I promised, this is the last question now. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, if there's truly been an exogenous event that knocked us out of equilibrium, uh, it's COVID. Yeah. Uh, and, um, um, you know, in, in addition to uh, all of the talk about build back better, which is, you know, broadly a discussion about industrial policy, how we yeah. structure yeah. the economy to make it zero carbon, uh, more, uh, you know, fair and just and so on. Um, there's also a lot of debate about the huge macroeconomic experiment countries have been running with massive uh, fiscal stimulus, uh, extraordinary monetary uh, interventions, uh, and, and so on. Has the experience um, with this new thinking, uh, you know, caused you to think differently about that experiment and, you know, concerns that inflation may come back or, or um, uh, you know, that uh, we, we may have a long run problem with the massive deficits that are being accumulated. Um, you know, I, I, yes, yes. Uh, it, I, I, I'll tell you why. Um, it, it, first of all, um, there are a bunch of nutters out there who think that too much public debt is, I don't know, it, they don't seem to think it'll need to lead to German hyperinflation, but they seem to think that it's so desperately worrying. I just don't think that is a problem. We can cope with high levels of public debt. Olivia Blanchard's very important um, um, presidential lecture to the a American Economic Association is about that. What, what is the interesting discussion is now about whether the Biden stimulus will be too much. And I'm on the side, and, and you know that Larry Summers and indeed Olivia Blanchard have gone out there saying this is dangerous. The inflationary risk is very high. Uh, my view is th they might be right, but I still worry about investment recovery. And, and I st you can see what I just, <laughs> you can see why that's coherent with the Carlin and Soska story that I told you 10 minutes ago. I'm not convinced that investment will recover to enable build back better to happen as a private sector response to a, 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 the COVID problem. Um, there's another quite separate set of issues about climate and structural change and carbon tax. And let's put them all on one side and just go, will build back better? No, no, forget the better even. Will build back happen after COVID from the private sector, and 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 the dominant discussion amongst those uh, who are critical of the Biden side of the stimulus is, I think, an assumption that it will just build back better, and that looks to me very much, um, you know, there's a numbers issue, there's a serious research question, and I don't, I'm not parading a kind of Mickey Mouse answer. It's a serious issue. But I am reminded of all those uh, projections after the global financial crisis, in which they, they all went upwards, backwards, towards the old growth path. And, and they look really silly five years later. And you can see that that rep reply that I'm giving you is consistent with my thinking that this multiple equilibrium way of understanding the economy is important for, for not just analytically, but for, for the real kind of present day policy questions. Excellent, David. Well, I think that's a, a good place to 
uh, wrap up. Um, uh, you know, some some big issues to be navigated uh, yeah. over yeah. the coming years, and um, uh, uh, the rebuilding uh, macro theory project. I'm, I'm sure will uh, make Continue. contributions yep. to, to those issues. Um, so I just just leave it. Uh, to, to thank you, David, for your time, and also for uh, anyone watching, if you'd like to actually see the papers that we've been talking about, um, you can go to the uh, Oxford Review of Economic uh, Policy website and, and uh, get access to uh, both special issues. And also, if you look at our website, uh, inet.ox.ac.uk, uh, uh, you can find uh, various working papers uh, from David, uh, his uh, colleagues, John Muehlbauer, Don Farmer, and others uh, on uh, many of the issues that we've been talking about. So with that, uh, we'll leave it. Thank you very much, David. And thank you very much, Eric.